Well, good morning. This morning, we're going to be talking about the neurobiology of love and attachment. Now, with several things we all know about love, you know, the song, love is a many splendored thing. We also know that love is the stuff of lofty poetry, rapturous movies, really bad country songs, and weepy movies. Now, we've also heard, the fa we've heard it said that love is a commitment or a decision. Now, I remember my mother talking about that and made it sound like love is sort of like okra. Now, okra was a food I hated because it was slimy. And my mother always kind of made it sound like falling in love was something you did because it was good for you. And if you enjoyed it too much, there was something terribly wrong with it. Well, the question is, all of these are lofty, exciting, noble, and different ways. So why mess up love by talking about dopamine or the amygdala? or other kinds of neurological structures. Well, let me just say, I'll give you a little bit of background. My area of study is something called social neuroscience, which looks at the neurobiology of human relational behavior. And let me just share um, a few of the points, there's more that I've listed here, but just a little bit about what social neuroscience is all about and why, why it's so interesting. I mean, it really is very interesting and something I've been interested in studying for years. Got to study it with my PhD research. I actually did some research on a monogamy molecule, something that actually is, uh, makes male animals monogamous. So we were trying to figure out if it would make male humans monogamous, and that's a whole separate story, so I won't get to tell that one today. But also, social neuroscience helps constrain our theories. It helps us know a little bit more about you know, various models, and everyone from Freud to Murray Bowen, other behavioral science uh, professors and leaders have come up with models of human behavior. And sure enough, they exhumed Freud and discovered there really was a big picture of his mother right in the middle of his brain. No. Um, <laughs> but like a lot of the, the theories of these various uh, behavioral scientists can now be studied neurobiologically, neurobiolo and we know that some of the things they said were true, but we also can pretty much pinpoint reasons why many of these theories are not totally true. What's wrong with them? Anyway, um, it gives us practical ex uh, tools for understanding our own experience in various aspects of life. Gives us some tools to change our personal relationship. Helps us know some things about how we make decisions. Do you know that your brain has already made a decision before you even know it? And some people say that they make their decisions totally rationally. Neuroscience now tells us there's no such thing. You know, some people buy a car and they read consumer reports and they say, I am totally rational in my decision making. Well, what happens is that their brain reads consumer reports and a little click reaction happens in their brain and they go, ah. Oh. Whereas somebody else gets in that car, runs their hands across the sh uh, um, shiny paint or smells the interior fragrance of the new car and their brain goes, ah. But if your brain doesn't go, ah, you can't make a decision. And your brain has already made the decision before you even know about it. Neuroscience also tells us something about what we call neuroplasticity, how you can change, how much you can change, and we're going to actually be talking about that tomorrow. Tells us something about how technology affects us. You know, you've seen all these people who walk around with their iPhones, sort of like a divining rod looking for water or something. And there's some people who will be right with the person they say they love the most, and yet they're so busy texting or checking their email or something. There's some interesting reasons for that, why our brain, especially male brains, by the way. Female brains do a little bit better job of kind of resisting the technological seduction. But lots of students, for example, report that they, they're actually, you know, nearly half of all students uh, report on a one to five scale, they're either a four or a five, on their smartphone addiction. So anyway, technology is, has an interesting way of wiring itself to our brains. What makes us happy or satisfied? Well, how we do politics? For example, we now know that Democratic brains and Republican brains are different. That's a whole story in itself. Now, the money one is really interesting because it really applies more to what we're talking about this morning, the neurobiology of love. But one thing we know is that there are differences between saver brains and spender brains. Now, a saver brain hurts when it tries to spend a lot of money. Now, a spender brain goes euphoric. Now, it's interesting also we know that savers and spenders always manage to, to marry each other. That's no joke, that really is true. So a saver and a spender, they marry each other, they spend the rest of their life getting frustrated by each other. 
But we also know that uh, the normal mechanism that makes many people kind of have a little bit of a pain response when they spend too much money, when you use a credit card, the brain scans show that your brain doesn't have the same pain reac reaction that you would if you were just spending money with a check or cash. That's one reason why a lot of merchants try to get you to buy everything on credit card, because your insula, a little area of the brain that slows you from spending too much money, doesn't work properly when you're using a credit card. Many things about the chemistry and wiring and mental health and moods that we now understand from neuroscience, kind of what's happening in your brain when you get depressed or when you get anxious. We know a lot about learning. How do you learn? How does the brain function? Even temperament. We understand some things about how temperamental factors are wired in. But even in terms of solutions uh, for major social problems, for example, we now know a lot about lead. You know, lead that was in paint, was in gasoline, and one of the major reasons we now know that crime has been on a steady decrease here in the United States is because of the eradication of, of lead in paint and in gasoline. And the brain damage caused by lead was probably a major reason why, um, why crime spiked you know, a few decades ago. And that's just something we've learned recently from brain studies and studying the level of, of lead in the brain. Even religious experience, um, we know a lot about how religious experience happens, how religion ch can change us. There's even such a thing as a God helmet. They wanted to see if they could give people religious experiences by putting a special helmet that stimulated religious areas of the brain. Yeah, it didn't work quite, yeah, because there's a lot more to it than that. You can create kind of mystical experiences and you can actually see how good devotional life changes your brain by studying over time what happens when you have regular time with God. But you can't turn an atheist into a true believer by um, stimulating the brain. Well, now I'm going to get to what we're going to talk about more this morning, which is the neuroscience of relationships and love. And we know, for example, that relationships are crucial to everything in our lives. Uh, neuroscience tells us how we connect with other people, what happens when we fall in love, the different attraction states. You know, it's, it's not cheap and it's not portable. We now have the technology that if you were going on a date with somebody and you wanted to find out how they really felt about you, you could scan their brain and discover the real truth. Now, as I say, it's not cheap, it's not portable, we don't have a little iPhone app that you could just go zzzz, you know, across a person's brain. But that will come someday, I'm sure. You know, somebody sitting there in the, you know, across the, uh, the candlelit uh, dinner table and they're saying, I love you truly, and the other person gets out their iPhone, zzzz, Nope, you just have the hots for me. And it is something different. Um, we also can learn a lot about what happens to relationships over time. For example, there is a difference between short-term chemistry and long-term chemistry. And people don't understand that. And so at some point in their relationship, they say, oh, we don't love each other anymore. Well, maybe what they're going through is the transition from short-term to long-term chemistry. We know a lot about how sexual templates are formed and how they can be linked to real relationships. And there's always a gap between whatever it is we find hot and the reality of a real relationship. Unfortunately, we can't talk about that today. Things about conflict, and we'll talk a lot about strengthening relationship bonds and improving relationship chemistry. Let me say a little bit about just some of the, the research on the social brain. Did you realize your brain is a social organ? It's actually wired for relationships. It's deeply wired into who you are. Um, you have several mechanisms in your brain, such things as what we call mirror neurons. And they're kind of like a brain Wi-Fi, so that when you're with people that are significant to you, your brain and their brain kind of get into a wired state together. Uh, several other brain structures that are designed that way. And over time, with all the significant people in your life, you actually form something called a neurobiological system, um, a distinct relational uh, footprint. So anybody, it's, it could be a roommate, somebody you work with, uh, could be a spouse, could be your kids. And one of the ways you can, you can discover that is just what happens when, if you have a, uh, a cell phone with different ringtones. Now, I haven't bothered my new, uh, my new iPhone to, to, to plug in all the different, different ringtones, but I had a, an old cell phone, one that actually died a tragic drowning death. It was buried in baptism, but it did not rise to a newness of life. But at that point, I'd, I'd gone through and I had um, actually put a different ringtone for everybody I knew that called me with any frequency. 
And what was interesting is I noticed that when I'd hear the ringtone, I already had that neurobiological response to that person before I even started talking to them. Just the ringtone was enough to evoke that person. Now that was shortly after my son started college and he um, has attention deficit and you know, doing pretty well with it. But at that point he would forget things. So he'd often call dad, I, you know, I don't have any money, I lost my, my, uh, my ATM card. And so I remember when he would call, I was going to, oh no, what now? That's gotten a lot better since then. But anyway, that just shows you how you have that kind of neurobiological neurobiolo response to people. Now in spouses, sometimes it happens that they just walk into the room and you say, you don't even need to say a thing, I know what you're thinking. But your body is actually having a response to that person. Either your stress levels rise, or you get a kind of that, ah, oh, they're here. So that happens, as I say, with all of our significant relationships. And we actually call it an ISO, an internalized state of the others. So you actually carry inside yourself everybody you're close to. You know, you have a little model of them, a little neurological self, you know, that person. We call it the internalized sense of the other. And we're designed to live in relationships. Uh, Jonathan Haidt calls it hives. He says that human beings are hive, he calls us hival. You know, we might say tribal. You know, we're designed to live in, in, in clusters. But as I say, you can measure the quality of a relationship at a neurobiological level and even predict divorce. You know, how much, how likely is a given couple to divorce? You can just tell by what's happening in their bodies when they're together. The body doesn't lie. Now, good relationships are a good health habit. Now, we talk about Loma Linda as a blue zone, you know, a place where people live long and people are healthy. And I think about all the people I know here in Loma Linda who've lived very full and long lives. I think of Herb Wiles, who I work out with, who's 101. I think of Marge Jaton, who passed away at 106. You know, several other people like that. But Good relationships are actually one of the most effective health, plan, uh, health habits you can adopt. There was a research study where they were feeding one group of, of rabbits some good Loma Linda green food. And another group of rabbits, they were feeding junk food. And they were wanting to understand how this impacted coronary artery health. Well, it was, the experiment was mostly working the way it was supposed to. But they discovered that one of the groups of rabbits that was getting the unhealthy diet was actually doing very well as far as their coronary health. It was confounding their whole research study and they finally figured out what was going on. The healthy rabbits were being taken out of their cages for, and petted for 20 minutes. So one small group of the lab assistants would take out the rabbits and pet them. And that was enough to offset all the bad diet. Now, um, I guess the part of the lesson is better Twinkies with love than tofu without it. But even better, you might say that um, tofu and love, that's probably a pretty good combination. So I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> eat Twinkies. One of my students finally brought me one a few couple of years ago. I'd never even eaten a Twinkie. And I'm pretty ghastly, so don't eat them. They're bad. <laughs> Anyway, several other things, I won't go through all of these, but you know, song, strong social support um, caused a 50% reduction in death rates in a seven year period for a study involving 300,000 people. Um, good social support makes it less likely that you will catch a cold if you're exposed to the cold virus. Hugs raise a chemical called oxytocin, it reduce blood pressure, and reduce cortisol. So a good hug is a good stress reliever. Anyway, I'll skip over um, some of these, but just even feeling love and cared about lowers your blood pressure. And some of the most interesting experiments on this were actually done with uh, inflicting small wounds upon people and discovering uh, how different social relationships impacted people's healing up from wounds. And what they discovered is that you heal a lot faster if you're around somebody you really care about when you have a good, positive social relationship. If you're in a marriage where you fight all the time, it actually takes longer for you to heal from superficial wounds. So relationships actually even impact healing. S poor social support has been shown to be more of a health hazard than obesity and similar in health effects to alcoholism. So when we talk about good health and long life and blue zone, one of the things we really should emphasize is the fact that social support is an important part of that and is actually part of the reason that people in Loma Linda probably do live longer. There's a strong social community here. 
Um, I'll just mention the last one that many addictive substances actually occupy brain receptors that are designed for relationships. So that's why one of the best ways to treat addiction is through good relationships. Now I want to say some things about adult love, love and attachment. Uh, a woman named Helen Fisher, um, who has done a lot of research on love and attachment in the brain, has actually talked about three relational neural states. Uh, lust, romance, and attachment. When we talk about lust, we're not talking about something negative here. But she talks about lust as a feeling of sexual desire, and she has done a lot to analyze all the chemistry of lust. And you know, what is it that, that just helps you feel a kind of sense of sexual attraction? And she's done a, a lot of research on the brain structures, the chemistry, and things like testosterone, dopamine, how some of these chemicals affect that. And it's, what's interesting, though, is that uh, that feeling of just being hot and lustful is actually a very different brain state than romantic attraction. You know, they're both good in the right context. I mean, you certainly don't want to marry somebody and discover that they have no attraction to you. I mean, that's not going to be a good thing. But we do know that just that kind of um, hot hormonal feeling is quite different from romance. But there are some limitations if all you have is lust. I remember when I was a kid, you know, we hear, heard about something called Playboy. I didn't even know what it was, but I heard about something very wicked thing that had been unleashed upon the human race. And as I say, I wasn't even sure what on earth it was, just that it was bad. But now we look at Hugh Hefner, who seems so radical and wild and free and libertarian then, and he's just kind of pathetic because, you know, he has formed so much of his sexual template around just the lust circuitry. We now know that if all you're doing is activating the lust circuitry and not running that through the whole relationship circuitry, it gets old. You know, the novelty wears off. And after a relatively short period of time, even if you were the most with the most beautiful person in the world, you get bored with them. So that's one reason why it's so important to be able to s integrate that circuitry with the rest of our whole relational circuitry. And we've heard it said at church and everything, but actually now we even know neurobiologically why that's the case. Anyway, so people who just have the lust circuitry and they don't have the, um, the whole relational circuitry tied into it discover that, you know, that they just have this free-floating feeling. They often have affairs, they get divorced, they need new people because the, the euphoria wears off. Now, romance is a whole different story. Now, romance is something we sing about and the poets write about and the ancient bards celebrated and often it was something that you felt for somebody you couldn't actually be with. But it's much more complicated when we scan the brain. What's happening inside your brain when you're feeling romantically attracted to somebody? The first thing we know is it can't just be free-floating. You know, you can have kind of free-floating, lusty responses. But romance is a whole different story. I mean, romance is about somebody in particular. And if we show you a picture of your dearly beloved, you know, your brain will light up like a Christmas tree. Only about that person and not about somebody else. And there's a whole rich chemical cocktail that gets going, especially new romance. And new romance triggers a whole variety of chemical changes. Interestingly enough, it actually makes a man's testosterone levels drop and a woman's rise. And I tell women, well, that's why he's reading you poetry and he's walking along the beach with you and um, he's, you know, just says, oh, let's just work on a relationship. I say, take advantage of it while you've got it. He's more girly now than he'll ever be again. But that's actually part of the chemistry of new love. As they say, for women it actually rises. There's a chemical called serotonin, which actually is used in a lot of antidepressants. But when you're newly in love, your serotonin levels actually drop, which seems surprising. But one of the chemical effects of serotonin is that it reduces your obsessiveness. That's one reason why you're newly in love, you get, actually get more obsessive about somebody, is because your serotonin levels drop. There's several other things, nerve growth protein and some others, and it's, as I say, kind of a rich chemical cocktail gets going when you're newly romantically in love. And in that particular chemistry tends to wear off after about two years. That's why some people have what I call the cell phone syndrome, new every two. You know, they get tired of a relationship after two years because they're addicted to the chemical cocktail of brand new love. 
Now we'll talk about some ways to keep chemistry going over the long haul, but one thing to just keep in mind is that long-term chemistry and the euphoria of new love are different. Now you can actually get that kind of lovesick feeling when you're newly in love. I remember one person saying, well, I thought I was in love and then I realized it was just the flu. But there's something about that euphoria of new love that actually is a little bit similar to being sick, you know, because you kind of feel that, kind of that ache, that, you know, can't live without you baby kind of feeling. Anyway, several different chemicals to it. But the prob problem is if all you're doing is building on the euphoria of new romance is that it often is enhanced by relationships that are doomed or out of reach. Actually, interestingly enough, if your parents tell you not to date somebody, it actually makes you feel stronger romantic attraction to them. We call it the Romeo and Juliet effect. You know, just from a brain perspective, it gets obsessive. You know, that's why people just always want to be with that other person. But as I say, the, the, it kind of wears off after about two years. And we'll talk about long-term chemistry. I mean, some of you say, oh, we're doomed, you know. I mean, we've been married for a bu bunch of, you know, a long time. What do you do? Um, but now we'll talk about attachment. Now, attachment is what we call long-term happy love. And that's kind of what keeps you going, keeps the home fires burning, you know, keeps you really enjoying that person, you know, year after year, decade after decade. It also has a lot to do with the relationship between parents and children. And it's not about the fireworks, but about the long-term glow. And so some of what we'll talk about today is, you know, can you keep that alive? What can you do to, to make, that, uh, make that last? But it's pretty important. And what I would say this morning is that if you want to keep at least, a, you know, a kind of romantic love and um, a passionate love going, you know, it's important to understand the role of in the, the entire attachment system. And that holistic, you know, working so your relationship is really wor worked into your whole brain. Now, one thing I will say, though, is that there should be some initial chemistry. You know, when uh, people talk, uh, talk about love, you know, this shouldn't be just something where that person is good for you. You know, I mentioned my mother's um, idea about, you know, you know, love was like okra. Now, sometimes she would talk about daughters of various friends of hers that, she wanted me to meet. Maybe the friend was going to be in town, their daughter was going to be with, with them, and back you know, when I was in high school. And of course, my first question was always, now what does she look like? Now, you all know 16-year-old boys are superficial, and I, mea culpa, I acknowledge that. But my mother always used to say, now that doesn't matter. She is such a nice girl. And nice girl, of course, meant unattractive. Now, that's what we all knew <laughs> that it meant. Now, there are some limits to getting your attraction system too focused in on looks. I mean, it has its place, but, you know, there are limits. It does tend to wear off, even if you were married to somebody who is totally gorgeous. But what I would say is there should be attraction. You know, if people come to me and, uh, for premarital counseling or couples here on campus who go through my preparation for marriage class. You know, one thing I do stress in the class is I say you should feel some chemistry for that person. You should want to be with them. They shouldn't be just like dental floss. You know, somebody, well, this is good for me. I know I need to spend this time with them. You know, in the long run, it will pay off. But not something you get too excited about. There should be some, some chemistry. And so I tell people, pay attention to that. If there's no chemistry, that is a warning sign. Now, some of the initial chemistry does seem to be enhanced by obstacles. If somebody comes too easily, you know, you say hi and suddenly they're throwing themselves all over you. There you are. I've been waiting my whole life for you. You know, that, that, that tends to backfire. You know, having to overcome a few obstacles makes the chemistry work better. Um, intense experiences. They did some experiments with a, a rickety, shaky bridge and discovered that it would actually enhance feelings of, of chemistry and falling in love. But even things like rock climbing or bungee jumping, in some cases, you've got to find the optimum level. I mean, some of you are going to say, you know, some people are going to say, well, I'll take my dearly beloved that I'd like to fall, have fall in love with me bungee jumping. Well, some people will never speak to you again. But if you can find something at least to add some excitement, that does tend to enhance initial chemistry. Appearance plays a role, you know, be careful about putting too much stock on it because we do know that over time that the role of appearance and attraction does tend to wear off. We also know that people in long-term relationships tend to look more like each other. So, you know, look in the mirror before you look at, no. <laughs> um, we also know you tend to look more like your pets over time. So, but, um, you know, just being around people tends to be, you know, enhance the chemistry. 
we all have kind of an internal template, you know, something that's kind of like, you know, that's our template and somebody walks into our life who matches that. I remember when I met my wife, I actually met her at Dodger Stadium. She was a total stranger who ended up sitting by, uh, by me at, at Dodger Stadium. And I still remember just watching her walk down the stairs. And she was attractive, but there was also just something about the way she carried herself that immediately, whoa, this woman, you know, she fits my template. We got talking, found out you know, she was an Adventist, she was going to be going to the same college as me, and so we looked each other up when college started, and three years later we got married. But I did have that kind of internal template, and we all do. And that does have something to do with, um, with attraction. Now we talk about the three P's, I don't have time to say much about it, but we tend to pick, we project, and we provoke, which means that there is an attraction to people who remind us in some way of our parents. Now we may also, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'll never marry anyone like my mother or whatever, but there is that, that certain element of, uh, of initial attraction. We pick, we project, which means after a while we start saying, well, you're just like my mother. And we project, we provoke, which means after a while we start needling them until we say, see, you did it. You're just like mom. Anyway, more we could say about that, but here's the thing I want to stress, is that it is important to have initial chemistry and love. I mean, it does make a difference. It is, it, it is important that if you don't have, if, as I say, if somebody is just like, you know, the cold ochre or the cold oatmeal or whatever it is, you know, that, that's not a good sign because you can build into long-term chemistry better if you've had short-term chemistry. Like what I say is that a good counselor can heal the sick but not raise the dead. And good chemistry helps make the grind and the work of a relationship uh, rewarding. So, you know, you, sh you should feel good about that person. Now, here's an interesting thing, though. You know, I always was, used to be warned about the dangers of infatuation. There really is no separate state known as infatuation. You only know in retrospect. You know, infatuation meant you felt the good chemistry was something where there wasn't the rest of the substance. But the chemistry is really that, you know, you can't tell the difference just from a brain perspective. Now, we already talked about, we talked about the new love junkies. Um, let me say, oh yeah, here's just something to keep in mind, that there are people who experience strong chemistry in unhealthy contexts. Now, the one example I will use of that is the uh, people who are in abusive relationships. You wonder, you know, first question is, well, why don't you just dump the turkey? But what we do know is an abusive relationship will trigger a neurobiological spike. You know, when the person says, oh, baby, I love you so much. Let's just spend time together. I didn't mean any of that. You kind of go, ah, oh, euphoria. But there's something about the, you know, the, the cycle. You know, then it gets really bad, really ugly, really painful. And then it gets good again. So some people get a addicted to the spike. And then when they're in a healthy relationship, they say, oh, that person's just boring because of, the, of that addiction. Now, high drama relationships are also like that. And that's one reason I, in my preparation for marriage class, I warn people about the dangers of the high drama relationship. You know, it may kind of get some chemistry going, but it doesn't tend to correlate with a lot of long-term happiness. You know, unavailable does, uh, relationships will sometimes do that to people. But here's one of the main things I want to stress for all of you to understand. Some of the challenges and tasks of adult love are, number one, forming healthy attachment patterns. So you know how to be attached, connected with a person in a healthy way. You're not clinging on for dear life, nor are you always pushing them away. You can just enjoy the, the relationship. One of the other tasks is transitioning from short-term to long-term chemistry. If you don't do that, you just kind of slide into a state of lethargy and boredom. That's not good for a relationship. Uh, building a positive ISO. Remember the ISO, the internalized sense of the other. In a good relationship, when your significant other, your dearly beloved, walks into the room, something good should happen before you even start talking to them. You should have an automatic kind of a default, a template for that person that feels good. You know, where they walk in the room, you don't immediately say, I know what you're thinking. And, you know, just that, that kind of angry or painful response. So building a good relationship, this is one way we can actually measure relational quality. We can just tell in your brain if you have a good ISO of somebody. Now, creating strong attunement, that's a little bit different from attachment. Attunement um, simply means that when you're actually talking to somebody, that Wi-Fi mechanism in your brain and theirs really wire into each other well. So you get it, so you're tracking with each other. And so we can, as I say, we can actually measure this in the brain. 
that if you're attuned to somebody when you're actually having a conversation or you're with them, um, that we can see those, you know, the mirror neurons are firing, the various other relational centers of the brain are just in that state of flow where they're really truly attuned to each other. So that's what's actually happening when you're actually uh, spending time together. Now reducing polarization, this is also a brain state thing. Remember we talked about savers and spenders? We talked about how savers and spenders marry each other. But what happens over time, we also discover that people polarize off each other. That the, the saver is saying, you are not going to spend any money at all. And that makes the, the spender more likely to binge. Now that even happens uh, with sexuality. Um, when I was working in a marriage and family therapy clinic, I worked a lot with um, sex therapy, and that's something I actually teach the psychiatry residents here. But one of the things I, you know, I would talk about is how people would come in and they would, you know, one person would say, I married a movie star. I'd say, what? And they'd say, you know, in Titanic, the one the boat ran into? The iceberg? And the other person would say, I married a sex maniac. And what, what you discover is that they actually started more similar to each other. But the one who had slightly higher desire would say, maybe I don't want it until Saturday night, but I better start working it on Tuesday night. And so the other person was just, you know, with lower desire, just simply got resistant. So over time, they polarized. Now, there's some of that that happens just naturally. I mean, we tend to marry people, even our brains like people who are a little bit different from us. Like one of my questions is, why don't pursuers and distancers all, um, why do they always get together? Like every marriage is composed of a pursuer who chases and chases and never quite catches, and a distancer who runs and runs and never quite gets away. I mean, the distancers could all marry each other. Honey, I'm home. I'm going to ignore you all evening. Oh, good. I'm going to go to my room and I'll ignore you too. I mean, wouldn't they both be ecstatic? Or the pursuers, honey, I'm home. I brought this whole big book of love poetry. And let's just sit on the sofa tonight and stare into each other's eyes and lovingly and read poetry to each other. And the other person, oh, I'm so happy. You know, why do these people all marry each other? You know, why do the distancers and pursuers get together? Well, there's a balancing thing, but also we notice over time relationships tend to polarize. And so that's one of the tasks of a healthy relationship is to reduce polarization. Conflict, um, probably won't have a chance to say much about it, but we know conflict, what's happening in your brain? You know, we can, and we actually some, know some things about reducing conflict just from our studies of the brain. Aligning erotic templates and relational reality. As I say, it always takes some doing. I want to say a little bit about attachment styles because this is one of the things that's been most thoroughly researched with neurobiology, is looking at how it works out with attachment styles in the brain. Um, we talk about security. You know, one of the things that happens when your brain is in a good state, both to begin with and around somebody you really enjoy being with, if you're secure, you're comfortable with that person. You like being together. When they're there, you can really enjoy it. And then when they leave to, you know, go away on a trip or something, you're not dying of anxiety the whole time. Now, a lot of this was formed with study of children. And we noticed that children were, you know, that, that we could see attachment patterns even in children. But we now know that it's actually a big deal in adult romantic relationships as well. But if you have a secure attachment pattern that you can, you can empathize with people. You can receive support and, it, and, and you, you appreciate it. Now we think about two different types of insecure attachment. One is called avoidant and the other is called anxious. And as I say, we can actually measure these in the brain, you know, the different neuro, the, the chemistry. Now we see it starting with children. You know, avoidant children, they want to be left alone, do their own thing. They may be popular, but they don't let anyone get really too close to them. And they may be indifferent to their parents or their siblings, and they find it hard to rely on others. Now, here's the interesting thing, and part of my own research on the monogamy molecule, we're trying to test this one out, um, you know, whether we did discover that avoidant um, men have a lower level of the particular neuropeptide I was studying. And, and actually, we also know that um, avoidant men in particular are more likely to be promiscuous. Now, with women, it's a little bit more mixed, but an avoidant man, you know, he's the one who, you know, will go out for one night stands, he'll get somebody's phone number, doesn't call back in the morning. Now, that's, that's classic avoidance. And, you know, you can probably think of a few actors like that. <laughs> George Clooney comes to mind as least famous for, you know, be, being that. They like short-term relationships, they're distant, they find long-term relationships confining. Um, and avoidant men withdraw from their partners when they need it the most. 
Now, an anxious attachment is the opposite. It's, it's what I call the, the boa constrictor pattern. That's where somebody kind of hangs on for dear life, and, you know, they suck the life out of every good relationship, and, you know, you... Um, and one of the things that happens is when they're in close relationships, they never quite trust it. Now, with children, anxious children will cling to their parents. They'll kill off friendships by being too demanding or insecure. They want lots of reassurance, but they don't believe it, and they cry more easily than most children. And their feelings are hurt easily. But this does carry over into grown-up relationships. And people who are anxiously attached tend to be hypervigilant. I've worked with people who followed, you know, <laughs> would track their partners around everywhere. They'd get in the car and follow them everywhere. They'd check the odometer, how far have you been? Well, Stater Brothers is further away than that. You know, you couldn't have just gone to the grocery store. They get preoccupied with their partners. They get obsessive. They like intense romance. But their classic question for an anxiously attached person, or the, 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 the statement is, tell me you love me and mean it. And so the other person says what? I love you. And then the other first person says, but you're only saying that because I told you to. You didn't really mean it. So nothing's ever quite enough. Well, I want to just say some things now, just to kind of put it together. There's you know, a lot more we could say about all of these. I mean, just this is, you know, I teach whole quarters long on this stuff. So believe me, it's a gold mine that just never runs dry when we talk about marriage, talk about parenting, talk about sexuality, talk about, you know, all these different things. But there are some things we can do to actually build strong love and attachment over time. But one of the first things I want to stress is just the idea of being aware that any of your close relationships, it may be in marriage, but even this, this even applies to friendships as well, but just pay attention to what's actually happening inside your own body when you're together. That doesn't mean you blame the other person. See, you know, you made my neuro, mirror neurons go crazy. I mean, it's, it's not that simple. You can't blame somebody else. But realize that when you're trying to build a good relationship, you're not just making love as a decision, you're actually trying to create by your decisions a state where you are building something, where being around that person is actually creating positive, healthy responses. That's the goal of, of, of good relational work. That is far more important than solving problems. A guy named John Gottman did a lot of relationship research and real, uh, said that over half of all marital problems never get solved. But what happens is the couples that are successful together, what ha they, they get a kind of attunement with each other so they can laugh, they can be, feel good around each other, they can enjoy each other, even if the problems don't get solved. The problem with too much emphasis on problem solving is sometimes even if the problem was solved, you know, even if somebody could just hit a button and make all the problems go away, that would not necessarily get at what's really going on in the relationship. I and mean, we often blame it on this. Well, I'm just upset with you because you leave the tube of toothpaste, you know, the, 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 the cap off the toothpaste or something. Um, you know, one of my famous mantras when I'm doing marriage counseling is I don't do personality transplants. That's what everybody wants. But just realize that the goal is to create a state of positive attunement. And you can have that even if all the relational problems are not solved. So it isn't a matter of solving all the problems. Love is not just a decision, but good decisions can build good chemistry. The decisions you make are the decisions to invest in the relationship in the way where you're forming good attunement, good ISOs, just that good healthy way of being with another person. But here's another little wrinkle on that. We have to start with self-management. Now I have all kinds of cartoons and, you know, visuals I normally use with this, but a lot of them I picked up off Facebook, and I don't know the sources of them, and so since we're doing it in this context, we can't, you know, we don't I, I have any way of tracking down what's, what someone might have posted that might be copyrighted, but I have some things on, you know, remote control. We all know what that's like. You know, you've got to take back the remote control to your own life and say, I'm going to work on my end of this relationship. I'm not going to give the remote control to my life to somebody else and say, see, you made me feel bad. And all of the best marital counseling models work with self-management. You know, that you learn to manage your own state, and when you do that, it creates a gravitational pull on your partner. So they end up being more likely to change to match that. Uh, just several things we know that have a lot to do with it. The first one is, is just tone of voice. Tone of voice is one of the biggest mediators of relational quality. 
Now, some of you remember when you were a kid, your mom used the tone, and you knew you were in big trouble when mom used the tone. But spouses use that with each other. And so just, you know, we, we do know that that makes a big difference in the quality of relationship, just managing your tone of voice. You know, don't walk into the room and I'm going to do fingernails on the, the chalkboard tone because that will make you suffer and then I'll get what I want out of you. You know, people are amazing at doing stuff that doesn't work. Increasing shared pleasure, laughter. You know, we do know that laughter helps create that positive ISO and attunement. Listening to music together, playing together, aesthetic experience, the spiritual experience. You know, all of these things are things that they create that sense of brain attunement with each other, where you're sharing the positive experience. So, you know, things like date night, it's not just, well, we better go to Denny's again. You know, it's a matter of finding something that where you really get attuned and you enjoy, you know, eating a meal together is a, is a positive thing. Telling stories and creating good memories. You know, I noticed that with my kids, you know, they actually got me onto Facebook, but I posted all these pictures and they like it, all the pictures of our childhood, you know, their childhood vacations, but with spouses as well. You know, we tell the stories, you know, in families, you get around the dinner table, you talk about the happy memories, you put together maybe iPhoto, you know, whatever, and you share those together. That's actually a way of increasing that. Tactile bonding is particularly important. That means just that the touch factor. And that's one reason why when I teach classes on grief, I say some people grieve a lot more from the loss of a pet than they do from the people. You know, because the pet's always happy to see you. Oh, I'm so happy you're home, you know, and everything. And the people are, you know, some people are congenitally grumpy. You walk into the door, you know, whatever. And so, you know, you have that, all that tactile bonding with your cat and not with your spouse. Uh, check polarization. And one thing I tell people is just kind of mix up the roles sometimes. Don't get into these polarized roles with each other. Just pay attention. Okay, if, if I, you know, understand what's going on, I don't polarize with my significant other, you know, um, because, you know, one thing about polarization is it often creates a sense of deprivation. And we do know that if your brain is feeling deprived, it's much more likely to binge. Best way, as I say, to, to trigger a binge spending spree is to deprive somebody of, of all money. That's one reason I tell my couples, make sure you have some fun money. Don't just say, well, money's tight. We're both students. You know, have some fun. Some excitement into a dead relationship. Um, and find the optimal level. Some people need more novelty and excitement than others, but we do know that things that kind of get the adrenaline flowing and get the chemistry going actually does, it d does help with the bonding in a, in a relationship. You know, dealing with your baggage from the past, um, realizing sometimes you just have to tell, tell yourself, okay, this isn't about this person. This is baggage I have left over from somebody else. And I always tell, also tell people, look at the context of your relationships because, you know, learn, learn who's safe, um, who's not. But partnered love, romantic love, works better in a whole social context. You know, that's one reason I do say it takes a village. You know, make sure you have other couple friends. Maybe some of you have had that happen. You were fighting and then you go out on a double date with your friends and you forgot totally what you were fighting over. Good relationships, good families, good marriages need social context. So I tell people, before you put all your emphasis on falling in love, will transport you into euphoria, make sure you've been kind of healing in the other contexts of your life. Um, this one we don't have time to talk about, you know, some of my own research, you know, brain research on, you know, a sexual chemical. But one of the things I stress is don't split off romance or sex from genuine relational bonding. You know, that the sexual circuitry, if you, if you focus that on your commitment circuitry, that actually changes the brain. And some amazing stories I could tell you about that. Um, I won't say much, but just one concept from relational conflict, then we need to wind this up. But this is helpful to understand that what we do know from neuroscience is you have both a low road response and a high road response. And the low road goes to a little area of your brain called the amygdala. When your amygdala is firing, you are not rational. Your rational brain shuts down. A lot of times people are conflicted, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a big, big fight. One of the things I say, you know, one of the best things brain science can tell us is cool down first. Don't insist we're going to have a rational discussion about this because your rational brain is not working when your amygdala is firing. Now this is also applicable to parenting and children. I have a whole lot of stuff I teach parents about this. You know, a lot of parents are kind of, I'm going to give you consequences, kid. And the kid's amygdala is firing, the parent's amygdala is firing, and they're all just, you know, just, just about having to wipe them all off the walls. So give it time, cool off first, understand what's happening, and don't hold the person responsible for everything they say when they're mad. 
because if the rational brain is not functioning, it doesn't mean that's what they really think. Anyway, much more we could say about this, but I just want to close with the idea that, that love, yes, it's a decision, but it's about a lot more than just a decision. It's about creating good chemistry, bonding, so you feel that sense of secure attachment, both inside yourself and with the person you love. So you talked about the ISO, the internal yeah, sense internalized of the other. sense of the other, right. In, a, in an emergency room mm -hmm. or an ICU unit when the person is unconscious, can they still have that response to their family coming in to be with them? Yeah, there is a surprising amount, there's, there's some interesting research on that that, I mean, there are exceptions, but there are many times when somebody is not conscious where their body is actually having the calming, receiving the calming influence of the other person. Yeah, so that, that definitely, that's definitely a factor. Uh, I'd had to look up ones on that specific factor with patients. Um, Daniel Siegel is the one who's done some of the most research and writing um, on the whole subject of neuroscience and attachment and ISOs and that for a t type of thing. Um, several books I could, uh, by Dan uh, Daniel Siegel has written several books on that. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, you, you were talking about the task of health relationships and reducing mm -hmm. polarization. Do you mm -hmm. have any ideas on how you do that? Yeah, as I say, first thing is if you just recognize what's happening. I mean, number, one of the things I tell people is realize that even just from a neurobiological perspective, there are probably reasons why you were attracted to the person that you were attracted to. Because just even just for the wiring of the brain, you seem to want somebody in key ways who balances you. One of my classic examples is, I say we get all these examples of attention deficit people who marry obsessive compulsives. And you say, why on earth did they do that? Well, the, att uh, the attention deficit person realizes if I don't marry somebody obsessive compulsive, my life will always be out of order. But the obsessive compulsive says if I married somebody just like me, we'd never have any fun. You know, all we do is sit around cleaning or balancing the checkbook. So they kind of get together and they drive each other nuts. And so one thing I tell people, just pay attention to the things you actually do that push the other person away. Like for example, if you want to spend time with the person, you're more of the pursuer. And so you decide, I'm going to get that by saying, we never do date nights anymore. You know, I mean, <laughs> the tone of voice, the negative, the critical thing, and of course you're going to drive the other person away, which is going to polarize them more. Most people have learned the fine art of polarizing their partner as far as possible. So what I tell people is just learn either through tone of voice and also the way you frame your comments so you're actually more likely to get what you want from the other person. I mean, you can say, wow, I sure had a good time when we went to, you know, where, wherever it was. I just, that, that was really good. I liked that a lot. That's an example of a non-polarizing both in tone of voice and content. And so you actually bring the other person more into your sphere rather than pushing them apart. But the other thing is make sure you're not too locked in a given role because one thing we do know with polarization is that people just get stuck in a role. I was mentioning the example of sexuality. You know, I worked with couples who, you know, the sex life has been on the rocks for decades. And what I discover is that, you know, one person is saying, I don't have any desire at all. You know, for all I, I care, you know, I could become a nun or something, you know. Um, and it, it turns out that they really do. But they become so polarized they're completely out of touch with it because they put all the desiring in the hands of their partner. And so be aware of the fact that polarization often blocks off feelings you know, that we have, we're just not aware of them. And so one thing I do stress with people is mix up the roles sometimes. Like I'll sometimes tell the distancer, actually initiate time with your spouse and they'll immediately think, oh, you know, I'm going to be suffocated. I mean, we'll have to spend the rest of our lives spending every moment staring at each other and reading poetry to each other gag, you know, whatever. But I say the interesting thing though is if you initiate something that is foreign to you, you'll actually discover that your spouse's level of anxiety start dropping and they start pushing you less. And so you'll discover a whole different dimension to the relationship. 